My name is Nirav Shah, I'm at the OCR South Campus, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the rotator cuff. So the objectives of the talk are to understand the anatomy of the rotator cuff, uh, the evaluation of the rotator cuff, and for those of you who are signed up for the afternoon breakout session with Dr. Stockberger, be a little bit more detailed in that breakout session, but just general principles. And then common problems of the rotator cuff and how we handle them. Uh, impingement, partial tears, full tears, and then the end all, which is reverse or rotator cuff uh, arthropathy, which uh, happens with very large tears of the rotator cuff. So we'll start with the anatomy. Uh, bony structure, obviously you have your humerus here, which forms the ball of the shoulder joint. You have your scapula here, which creates the glenoid of the shoulder joint. And so the main articulation of the shoulder joint is the glenohumeral joint. You have your clavicle up top. Uh, you have your acromion, which is a out process of the shoulder blade that goes above the humerus. We have our rotator cuff muscles. Uh, there are four of them. Uh, from the front view, we have the subscapularis, uh, which forms the tendon on the anterior surface of the humerus. Uh, from the back view, we have the two main muscles of the rotator cuff, uh, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus, and then the smallest muscle of the rotator cuff down here, the teres minor. The function of the rotator cuff, we, we think of them as very important muscles designed for function, designed for lifting of the shoulder, but in reality, the main purpose of the rotator cuff is actually shoulder stabilization. Uh, the goal is to keep that golf ball on the tee. Uh, and so the rotator cuff are what we call our dynamic stabilizers. They keep that ball on the tee. Uh, for those of you who have treated young patients who have shoulder dislocations and shoulder instability, obviously we always talk about fixing the labrum to help with shoulder stability. But we also have to include the rotator cuff because those muscles also keep that ball in place. But in terms of the muscle function, we have the supraspinatus. Uh, that is designed to initiate uh, lifting of the shoulder. So if you're down in this position here, the first 15 degrees of lifting, that is accomplished by the supraspinatus muscle. The infraspinatus is designed for external rotation. So if your elbow is down here and you externally rotate, that's the function of the infraspinatus. The subscapularis is internal rotation along with the pectoralis. And then the teres minor is external rotation in this position. So those are the dynamic functions of the rotator cuff. But again, the main principle for the rotator cuff is to stabilize the shoulder. How do we evaluate um, shoulder pain? Uh, obviously, the shoulder is a very complex joint. I personally think it is the most complex joint we have in the, in the body. Uh, it is designed to put your arm in space, um, to allow your hand to do what we need to do, and the shoulder positions the hand where it needs to go. There's a lot that can go wrong in the shoulder. Today we're only going to focus on the rotator cuff, but it's usually the most common thing to go wrong. So if you're a gambling person, if someone said, what is the problem in my shoulder? If you said rotator cuff, you'd be right about 80% of the time. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today. History, physical exam, and of course, imaging studies. So what do patients complain about when they have rotator cuff problems? Usually pain on the lateral aspect of the shoulder, sort of proximal arm area here. There can be radiation. Some people will get radiation down to the elbow. That is not uncommon. Every once in a while, you'll get radiation down to the hand, but that's usually, we, we tend to typically attribute that to cervical pathology and not necessarily shoulder pathology, but that is not unusual. Stiffness. Uh, difficulty lying on that side, difficulty overhead or behind in, uh, the back. A lot of people complain about putting on their coat, um, tying um, or uh, putting on their bra strap, those types of things. Very common issues with that. And then weakness or feelings of instability. Again, with the rotator cuff being a dynamic stabilizer, they feel like the, the shoulder is not quite positioned where it needs to be. And then, of course, we have to ask them whether there's a specific reason that they developed the pain. Was there a traumatic injury? Is it wear and tear? Did it happen over time? Those are important questions to ask as we start to determine what the treatment should be for their particular problem. Physical examination. Uh, palpation is typically not a very good um, diagnostic uh, tool in rotator cuff pathology, but it can help eliminate some other pathologies. Uh, the acromioclavicular joint, uh, where the acromion meets the clavicle, uh, a lot of folks do develop arthritis of this area. 
can be painful. Um, tenderness in that area is usually a good sign that that is a symptomatic problem for the patient. And of course, on some patients, you can feel and uh, feel tenderness at the anterior aspect of the shoulder, which may uh, be attributable to biceps tendonitis. Range of motion, of course, we want to check for, uh, especially with comparison to the other side. Uh, folks who can't move their arm, both actively and passively, compared to the other side, most likely have adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. Uh, active range of motion that is limited, but passive range of motion that is normal can be attributed to a rotator cuff pathology. And then finally, you want to compare strength. Uh, you want to make sure that all of the four muscles that we talked about in terms of their functionality, that the strength of those muscles is equal to the other side as well. So there are also special signs that we use in our examination. Uh, we have near sign there on the left. Uh, basically, you start the patient out in that position and lift their arm up. Uh, if they reproduce pain in that situation, it's usually a good sign that there's some inflammation of the bursa or the rotator cuff consistent with impingement. Same thing with the Hawkins test on the right, where you apply a downward force on the arm with some internal rotation of the shoulder. Usually a good sign that there is some form of rotator cuff pathology. Now, these two tests are not isolated to impingement. If someone has a partial or a full thickness tear of the rotator cuff, these signs will also be positive. Specific tests for each of the muscles that we talked about. First, the supraspinatus. We have our Job's test or our empty can sign, uh, thumbs down in 30 degrees uh, forward. So you're kind of going in the plane of the scapula. Uh, patients will report pain in that situation when there is um, inflammation of the rotator cuff you will often see weakness if there's a uh, more significant pathology like a partial or a full tear. The drop arm test on the right is usually a good sign of a full tear. Uh, as you lift the arm, they are no longer able to support it and it falls right back down to their side. Infraspinatus, as we talked about, is responsible for external rotation. Uh, you test their strength in external rotation, but you can also test for a lag um, by putting the patient's arm out to the side they still have to keep that infraspinatus activated, and if the arm starts to droop back towards the center, it's a usually a good sign that the infraspinatus is no longer co um, competent. Uh, similarly, if you're in this position and you lift their arm up, we call this the horn blower sign, uh, but basically if their teres minor is compensated, their arm will kind of drop back down as well. And then finally, the subscapularis, uh, we have two press, uh, two press tests, basically. There's the belly press test, and the liftoff test, one in the front of the abdomen, one behind. Uh, the belly press is you want to bring their hand right on their abdomen and ask them to bring their elbow forward and then push back. Uh, typically, in a uh, situation where the subscapularis is compromised, rather than pushing back directly, their elbow will droop behind and they'll kind of do one of these numbers rather than just being able to pull back directly. Liftoff test is the same concept, but you go behind the back and you ask them to pull their hand further behind them. The reliability of the physical exam, so we spent all that time and it is completely unreliable. <laughs> um, one physical exam maneuver is not enough to say this is definitively what's going on. Uh, using two or more helps, uh, but at the same time it is not necessarily, oh, definitively you have a rotator cuff tear. It helps guide us, but it's not the definitive. And so, generally speaking, we recommend that you don't rely on your physical exam to establish a diagnosis. It can help lead to the diagnosis, but not establish it. And mostly because all of us are different. All of us have different concepts of what is strong, what is weak, what is different, what is motion. Um, and so, the, the variability here is, is quite high. And so, although we should do it to guide, you don't rely on it. So, what do we rely on? Tests. First test, plain x-rays. We always get plain x-rays in orthopedics. Reason being is if you think it's a rotator cuff problem, you wanna make sure they don't have another problem. Arthritis, a fracture, a dislocation, or there's some form of alignment issues. All of those can mimic uh, rotator cuff pathology, shoulder pain, so you wanna make sure that those are excluded before you head down the rotator cuff route. If you feel that there is tearing of the rotator cuff, ultrasound and MRI are diagnostic tools that can be utilized to identify that. Ultrasound is a, it's a test that's around, it's usually mostly at academic centers. Um, I personally prefer the MRI, but ultrasound is cheap and effective. Uh, you can often identify a very large tear of the rotator cuff, small tears of the rotator cuff. 
The dilemma is that it's very operator dependent. Uh, it's reliant on putting the probe in the correct position, reliant on where the patient can put their arm. And so the sensitivity and specificity of that test are uh, less than the MRI. Again, sensitivity is the ability for the test to pick up a patient who has a problem. So if a patient has a rotator cuff tear, ultrasound is 46 to 93%, again, dependent on the study, at telling you, yes, that patient has a rotator cuff tear. Its specificity is much better, meaning if the patient does not have a problem, it's really good at telling you that patient does not have a problem. But the MRI is sort of our gold standard. It has a sensitivity of 100%, specificity of 95%, it gives us a lot more information than the MRI does. You can identify a tear. You can identify where the tear is. You can identify the size of the tear. You can look at other things. You can see if there's arthritis that wasn't picked up on the x-ray. You can see biceps, a chromioclavicular joint. It gives us much more information. However, it is, of course, more expensive. It takes more time uh, for the patient on that particular day of the exam. And then there's, of course, the issue of putting them into a small tube. And some people can't handle that. So now we're gonna talk about all of the various things that can go wrong with the shoulder cuff. Uh, we're gonna talk about impingement first. Impingement uh, for decades, we used to think of as a mechanical problem. Uh, the rotator cuff sits underneath the acromion and we thought that by lifting and reaching that rotator cuff was driven into the bone above it. So many studies have came out uh, saying, well, that's the problem, that's the problem, that's how we address it. And over the last decade, Slightly over a decade, we're starting to realize that that's not necessarily the case. Most rotator cuff patients are older, but they've lived with that bony anatomy for the first 60, 70 years of their life without an issue. And so the thinking is that it's more likely a combination of mechanical attrition because of the acromion above it, but also because as we get older, our ability to heal is not quite there. Uh, we have vascular compromise. The blood flow to the rotator cuff and the tendon is not what we want it to be. And the forces on the rotator cuff that have accumulated for 60, 70 years start to sort of degrade the tissue. And that's where the rotator cuff problems elicit. However, there are patients that are young, 30, 40 years old. Um, and so those patients, we can probably more attribute their pathology to the extrinsic, the mechanical attrition of the acromion above it. We ask them about their physical exam, their history. Uh, most people describe pain that developed without any sort of traumatic injury. Uh, again, pain on the outside, difficulty overhead, uh, difficulty lying on it. They'll have those positive signs of the near sign and the Hawkins sign, but most of the special tests to the test the individual tendons all are negative. In imaging studies, the, the x-rays are typically normal. Uh, the MRI might show some bursitis or some rotator cuff tendonitis, mo no definitive tear. How do we manage impingement syndrome? Uh, the gold standard is non-surgical. The vast majority of patients will get better with that. Uh, cortisone injection into that subacromial space and some either home exercise program or formal physical therapy. In this situation, approximately 80% of people will be able to avoid surgery uh, within two years of that uh, procedure being performed. They report better pain scores. They report better function. Uh, the function, of course, is a subjective measure. It's not an objective measure. So we don't notice a significant difference in their range of motion or strength, but in reality, we care about how the patient's doing, not necessarily these objective measures. And so the vast majority of patients can avoid surgery in this situation. There's no difference between surgical and non-surgical management for rotator cuff tendonitis, and so generally speaking, the philosophy is always to start with non-surgical management. And then for those of you who are interested in injection techniques, there has been no difference between doing a blind cortisone injection versus a guided injection. So the studies do not demonstrate that guided injections are any better than just doing it in the office. Surgical management. So when do we do surgical management for, for impingement? It's fairly rare, um, but when non-surgical management fails, uh, we consider doing a shoulder scope, uh, decompression, and acromioplasty. So what is decompression? Decompression is basically the removal of everything above the rotator cuff, which would be typically the bursa. You would also well, coplane the acromion. So what we want to do is make that surface flat, increase the space that the rotator cuff can live in, and then release the CA ligament from the undersurface of the acromion, again, removing some additional tissue at the very front of the shoulder to give that rotator cuff a little bit more room. 
arthroscopic, quick recovery, typically four to six weeks, uh, sling for a day or two just for initial pain management, but initiation of physical therapy pretty quickly. Satisfaction with this surgery is quite high, 88% uh, satisfaction rate. Most people are still doing well uh, in the future. The reason being, these patients never really had a tear. They didn't have much functional loss initially, and hopefully the surgical intervention will prevent further compromise of the rotator cuff down the road. We see improvement in their pain scores. We see improvement in their functional scores six months after surgery. And then the last controversy that is currently being hammered out in our field is whether we need to do the acromioplasty at all. Uh, a lot of uh, insurance companies have stopped paying for acromioplasty because studies have shown that acromioplastic, acromioplasty, where you remove the undersurface of the bone there, does not have any difference statistically in terms of our patient outcomes. There's a tendency that those patients do better, but statistically, there's no difference. I still do it because the worst thing to do is get an x-ray five years later and say, what was your doctor doing? And so just take it off. It takes five minutes to do. You don't have to worry about it down the road. Partial rotator cuff tears. You'll see that this slide is very similar to impingement. Uh, the same factors that create impingement create partial rotator cuff tears. Uh, the compression from the acromion typically results in a bursal sided tear and the um, vascular issues and aging can result in either a bursal sided or a articular sided tear. Sometimes there's trauma with these that create a partial tear, but oftentimes it is atraumatic. Same symptoms, uh, same physical exam findings. Radiographs, again, are typically normal, and your MRI will show a partial tear. You can see that little gap, that little white dot right there, the positive arrow sign. Um, telling you where the tear is. The vast majority of the tendon is still intact in this particular MRI, but basically a portion of the rotator cuff is torn off of its insertion site on the tuberosity. Quite common, 13 to 32% of the population currently are walking around, so about 105 people in this room have a partial rotator cuff tear. Uh, tears progress, according to some people. 40% uh, of people who have an asymptomatic partial thickness tear will progress to a full thickness tear in three years. And the answer, the question is, well, how do we know? Well, these are based on studies. We ultrasound these patients who have a partial thickness tear that don't have any symptoms, probably because they had symptoms on the other side and enrolled in a study, and we followed them for five years. 40% of them will go on to develop a full thickness tear even though they have no symptoms. 28% will progress at one year, and at least 80% of them will increase in size at one year. That's one school of thought. The other school of thought is tears don't progress. Uh, 76 don't progress at four years, eight progress to full thickness, according to this uh, study out of Korea. 42% had no propagation at 20 years. So who do we believe? Well, we don't really know at this point, which is unfortunate. We're still working on it. We'll still have studies in progress to determine what we should do with partial thickness tears. But the general consensus has been, if it's big to begin with, it's probably gonna get bigger. And if it's small to begin with, it's probably not gonna get bigger. And so our general rule of thumb is 50%. If you're bigger than 50% on your tear size, you have a higher likelihood of progressing, either getting bigger and staying partial or progressing to a full thickness. And if you are smaller than that, you only have a 14% chance of getting bigger. And the reason being is the bigger the tear gets, the more stress you're putting on the remaining tendon. And that tendon is going to compromise as time progresses. So how do we treat it? Well, it depends on the size of the tear, really. We can start non-surgical, physical therapy, medications, avoid what hurts. Typically, you wanna do that on the patients that you have a low risk of tear propagation, so the smaller tears. Uh, there has been improvement in pain and function with non-surgical management of smaller tears. Cortisone injection, plus or minus. Typically, a lot of these patients, because they don't have any functional compromise, will get the cortisone injection before we even have the MRI. But there is a risk to a cortisone injection prior to surgery. We've heard that in our talks about joint replacement. Well, there's the same with rotator cuff. It compromises the integrity of the tissue. And so there's a higher likelihood of failure of the rotator cuff repair if a cortisone injection is done prior to the rotator cuff repair. Surgical management. Uh, 
Again, if you fail non-surgical management, patients who have pain and dysfunction will want something done, and so that would be the patient that we would consider. Factors that we consider um, important to determine whether a patient should have surgery or not is, of course, age, activity level, do they have other reasons that they hurt? Uh, if they have biceps tendon issues, labral issues, we may be more likely to surgically intervene because we can correct all of those during one surgical procedure. And of course, what do they do for work? But the biggest reason to intervene in this patient is a big tear. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is you have a tear that progresses, is unrecognized, and as we'll talk a little bit later in the, in the talk, they develop rotator cuff tear arthropathy because the management of that problem is quite different than fixing the rotator cuff. Surgery offers good uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, fixing the rotator cuff uh, has a high success rate in terms of improving their functions and limiting reoperations down the road. So options to treat. If you have a patient who has failed surgical treatment but still has a small tear, i.e. less than 50%, you can just clean up the tear. You can uh, do the acromioplasty and has relatively good results, 79% uh, good to excellent at 10 years. You can also convert a partial tear to a full thickness uh, tear during the time of surgery and repair that. Or you can just fix the part that is torn. And there is some controversy here as well. Uh, some surgeons convert to a full thickness tear every time. And some surgeons always repair the partial thickness and leave the tendons intact. Both argue that their method is better because the other method creates a tension mismatch. So what does that mean? If you look at the picture, I'll point to this side to give this room a little bit benefit here. Oops. So if you look at this picture here, these tendon fibers are intact. This is torn. The, the patients or the surgeons who will complete the tear say, well, if I cut all of this out and then repair the whole thing, this tendon is no longer going to be pulled all the way down. They're going to be matched together. And the patient or the surgeons who will not will say, well, I'm going to leave these intact and I'm just going to pull half of the fibers out. So either way, you're creating a tension mismatch. Either the ones that were torn before are going to be tight, or the ones that weren't torn before are going to be tight. So in generally speaking, my philosophy, this is normal. Leave it. If it's big tear, meaning there's only 10% left, complete it, because most likely those fibers are already compromised, and you should convert it. But if it's about a 50-60% tear, leave the fibers that are intact intact, and fix the rest. And so in this picture, what we do is clean up the bone, put the anchor in, pass the stitches through the tendon that is torn. When you tie them, no more tear. Full rotator cuff tears, quite a different beast. Um, again, we talked about how partial rotator cuff tears can become full thickness rotator cuff tears, or you can have a fall and have an acute injury resulting in a full thickness tear. History is pretty relevant in terms of developing that traumatic injury, but the exam is quite different. A lot of folks will have weakness. Special tests that we discussed before will often be positive, but not everyone has weakness. And the reason not everyone has weakness is this new concept that has come out recently in the last decade called the rotator cuff cable. That is this little band of white that we see here. It is not quite on the bone. It is in the tendon itself. But oftentimes, just like a suspension bridge, if the muscle is intact, if the rotator cuff cable is intact, if this tendon is torn, the forces can still be transmitted to this end of the bone or that end of the bone. And so because the forces can still be transmitted to the bone, the patient can still lift their arm. And so again, this is why physical examination is a very unreliable method because again, the shoulder is a very complex structure and because we rely on it so heavily to position our hand in space, we've been designed with sort of fail-safe maneuvers. However, if your supraspinatus is torn and the anterior aspect of your rotator cable is torn, you no longer have that suspension bridge functioning. That's the patient who can't lift their arm anymore. Obviously, an MRI shows a full tear. So, natural history, once torn, always torn. It will never heal. The body does not have the ability to bridge that gap that has been created. 35 to 50% of them will get bigger over time. Larger tears, again, in a full thickness tear, are more likely to progress. Over time, the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, you start to get fatty infiltration of your muscle. You start to get atrophy of your muscle. And that happens very quickly, even three years after the onset of tear. And at five years, so not a lot of time, 
it typically becomes to the point where the atrophy is severe enough that we are no longer able to fix the rotator cuff tear. Uh, worsening pain, increasing weakness are a good sign that the tear is progressing. Factors that determine repair, uh, trauma versus degenerative, symptomatic versus asymptomatic, the patient, and then whether the tear is reparable or not. So traumatic tears, we tend to fix early. Uh, the studies indicate that early repair of a traumatic tear may have better functionality down the road, better likelihood of healing. It's marginally better than waiting, but generally speaking, young active patients with a traumatic energy injury and an inability to lift the arm, we will go ahead and intervene as soon as the inflammation and swelling subsides. Symptomatic versus asymptomatic, obviously someone who doesn't hurt, doesn't have any function loss, we're not gonna operate on. Uh, those patients are usually picked up on clinical studies when we're testing for other pathology or an MRI done for other reasons. Those patients we will typically advise that partial tears can progress, and so again, be mindful of development of pain, increasing weakness or dysfunction, as that's usually a good sign that the tear is progressing. Mildly symptomatic, but the function is intact. They're able to use it, they're able to lift, they're able to perform most activities, but it is painful. Again, this is likely secondary to the fact that that rotator cable is intact, so they're still able to lift their arm. It can be treated non-surgically, um, but of course, the tear can progress to the point where it becomes irreparable. And so this is where patient demographics will come in. If they're older, less active, they may want to try a non-surgical treatment first, which is reasonable, but the more active, younger patients, depending on their occupation, we will likely intervene surgically earlier. And then pain and dysfunction. So this is the patient who can't lift their arm, who can't get into their cupboard or the overhead compartment in the suitcase. Uh, those, we will typically intervene early. Non-surgical options are always presented, but I tend to lean a little bit more on those patients that Surgery is probably your best ultimate outcome in terms of return to function and pain improvement. Demographic factors. Uh, age is the biggest one. Uh, the older we are, the less likely we are to heal. The vascular situation within the rotator cuff is compromised, and so they are less likely to heal their rotator cuff. 65 is typically our age uh, where we start to see significantly increased rates of retear or failure of the initial repair. Uh, if you look at univariate analysis, so compare apples to apples, young people to old people, age is the most likely factor to determine whether the rotator cuff repair is going to heal or not. But if you look at all factors within the study, it's not age, it's actually fatty atrophy. So how long has that tear been present? If you have started to lose your muscle, that is the most likely reason that you're going to fail your repair. Fatty atrophy is a good indicator of age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have fatty atrophy, so they're kind of in lockstep with each other. But if you tease the data out, the longer you've had your rotator cuff uh, torn, the more likely your repair is to fail. And then, can we even fix it? Uh, if you can't get the tendon back to the bone, it's not going to heal, plain and simple. And so, large, massively retracted tears won't heal. Fatty infiltration, as we talked about, atrophy, some shapes, some sizes of tears are irreparable. And then smoking and diabetes. Uh, in rat studies, we have shown that tear, or making a rotator cuff tear, feeding them nicotine, and then repairing it, uh, they don't heal as well. Uh, we have not seen that as much in our human studies. Uh, there is some inclination that they impact healing, uh, but generally speaking, we don't say no just because they are diabetic or they do smoke. We just caution them that there's a higher likelihood that their repair won't heal. So what are the principles of rotator cuff repair? You wanna confirm, right? The MRI is a great tool, but it's not a camera. You wanna use your camera to make sure that you do have a tear. As we see in the bottom right, that is the torn tendon. You have the cartilage of the humeral head. You have the bone that it used to be attached to. You wanna take care of other things. You don't wanna go in there and find another problem and then have to come back three weeks later because you didn't address it at your operation. You fix everything that ails you. Uh, the bursectomy, the acromioplasty, again, with the controversy of whether we should be doing that uh, at all. Uh, you want to make sure that the tendon can get back to the bone. You are, there are techniques to mobilize the tendon, so if it's scarred down, you can release scar tissue uh, to release it and allow it to get back to the footprint. You want to debride the footprint. Uh, bone to tendon is healing. Uh, healing is better than tendon to soft tissue. 
And so what we do is remove all soft tissue from the bone so that the tendon has a good bed to sit on to allow that biological healing to happen. And then you want to repair it. Uh, there are lots of ways to repair it. That is uh, a couple of days worth of talks. Uh, there are entire uh, basically conversations that are still happening uh, beyond this scope, but there are many ways to do it, and everyone has their way, uh, but all in all, the data suggests that no one technique is definitively better than the other. And then you want to individualize the rehabilitation program. If it's a small partial tear, we can be a little bit more aggressive about the rehab. If it's a large retracted tear, maybe we take it a little bit slower to allow the tendon to heal before we get them into therapy. And what happens if everything goes wrong? Either we missed it, uh, the patient didn't come in, they let their partial tear progress, they let their full thickness tear progress, or they had a failure of the repair. Well, then you get rotator cuff arthropathy. Essentially what that is is the rotator cuff that used to sit above the shoulder is no longer sitting above the humerus, and that allows the humerus to ride up. Usually a sign of a massive tear. You develop arthritis, and you develop superior migration of the humeral head. If you look here, the center of the ball, center of the glenoid, those are no longer lined up. So the humerus is what we call escaping the joint. You're going to have pain, you're going to have weakness, you're going to have loss of motion. There's going to be atrophy of the rotator cuff muscles on your scapula. And plain radiographs are all we need. MRI is not necessary to diagnose the problem. Oftentimes we'll get an MRI prior to surgery for surgical planning purposes, but it's not necessary to establish the problem. How do we fix it? Start with conservative. Uh, the treatment down the road is a shoulder replacement. Whether you do that today or 10 years from now, the shoulder replacement is the same. And so we start with cortisone injection and physical therapy. Oftentimes we can repeat cortisone injections periodically to help with pain, um, and that is certainly viable. But when non-surgical management fails, we consider shoulder replacement. Uh, two options, one is to do a partial or a hemi, which is here on the left. The other is a newer technology, which is called a reverse. In a reverse, we switch the two. We put the ball where the socket used to be. We put the socket where the ball used to be. And the, the function of that is by, it changes the rotation of the shoulder. So instead of rotating around the glenoid, you're rotating around the humerus. And so that allows your deltoid to be able to lift the arm. And so you remove the rotator cuff completely in this operation. Uh, outcome studies show that the reverse is better. You have better pain control, you have better range of motion, you have better functional outcome after that operation. And so within our shoulder community, the vast majority of people are doing reverse arthroplasty for rotator cuff tear arthropathy, preserving the hemiarthroplasty for those patients whose bony anatomy won't allow it or surgical um, risks are too high to proceed with a bigger operation. That is it. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Oh, yes. Yes, so the question was, if the patient had a cortisone injection and then you do a rotator cuff repair, does it ever go back to baseline? And th the answer to that question is actually no. So it's diff very different than the joint replacements. In this situation, there is a permanent attrition to that tendon by the cortisone injection. Now, same risk applies. If I do a cortisone injection and then do surgery within a week, they're at higher risk for other complications, including infection. Um, the risk does diminish over time of a re or a failure, but it never goes back to zero. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, so the question was, is there a um, relationship between frozen shoulder and rotator cuff? And the short answer is yes and no. Uh, some patients will develop frozen shoulder without any rotator cuff pathology. So they have other disease factors like diabetes, thyroid disease, recent trauma, um, cardiovascular surgery in the near, um, you know, the, the recent past increases the risk of developing frozen shoulder without any rotator cuff problems. And so frozen shoulder, basically it's frozen, right? You can't move it. Most of you are physical therapists, so you've seen that in your practices. Patients with rotator cuff disease can develop frozen shoulder in addition to their rotator cuff disease. 
but they are two distinct entities. Is that, yeah. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you guys.